So today I'm going to talk about open access, or OA, from the perspective of a scholarly publisher. In the next 20 minutes, I'd like to go over quickly what OA is, and then discuss some of the issues that OA models are meant to address. Then I'd like to go over an initiative that my own institution, University of California Press, launched about a year ago, namely to create a viable open access model for publishing monographs. So what is OA? OA comes in many forms and means many things to many people, frankly, but it does have some basic defining characteristics. Content is available digitally and online, which are not always the same thing as I've come to find out. Free of charge to the reader. Uh, free, yes, but only to the reader. Free of many copyright and licensing restrictions. So what problems is OA trying to solve? One is access to research. As Sebastian and Fiona both discussed, um, we want to drive faster advances in innovation basically by making the content available more quickly so people can read it, respond to it, and publish their own replies. And this is true not just in the humanities, of course, it's true in the sciences as well, but across scholarly publication and communication. And then that leads to, of course, providing trust and information to all who need it. You know, people often say, well, if maybe you lowered your prices, people would buy more books. Unfortunately, that's not always an effective strategy, but the difference between, say, $25 and $35, or $75 for that matter, is not so great, but the difference between $25 and free actually is quite great. If you think about it for yourselves, you're much more likely to actually look at a book that you might be interested in if it's for free, if you only have to spend five minutes of your time. But if you have to go online, look at five books you might want instead, spend money down, get it, come to the library, get it back, look through it, it's a whole lot of effort for something that might not even be worth it in the end. And most people never even get that far. So with free access, Anyone anywhere in the world with an internet connection can automatically take that easy first step to decide whether it's something they want to invest more time in. And then also I would just add as well, for many people in American and North American universities, they're used to having a wide access because so much of their libraries captures um, the kind of main productions from scholarly presses. But if you're in India or Russia or even some parts of Europe, Often the collections are not as robust, and when there's not a firm digital offering um, from for pay, you're left without much access to research that may very much be vital to your own work. Again, once you have uh, it available online for anyone to read, anyone can read it, regardless of their institutional backing, regardless of their, um, you know, whether or not they're part of the academy. Anyone who wants to read it can. Okay, so the second problem is the soaring cost of scholarly journals. I won't spend a lot of time on this. It's much more true in science and technical and medical publishing, um, but that definitely has played um, havoc on library budgets, which are shrinking anyway. Uh, as most everybody knows, uh, money is always uh, harder and harder to come by, and libraries have uh, suffered just as much as departments have in the humanities. The third problem I'm going to call the monograph problem. Monographs are essential to scholarly communication in many fields, classics especially, and related fields as well, archaeology, ancient history more broadly. But it's also pretty much universally acknowledged that the system is broken, or at least it's broken down. Uh, as I've already mentioned, and as you know from your own experiences, libraries have seen their bu book budgets plunge over the past number of years. Library purchase of the standard monograph used to be somewhere around 1,500 copies 15 years ago. Today, it's around 200. And because of these financial pressures, libraries are looking into new models. Aggregated purchases, so for example, um, I believe Cornell and Columbia have entered into an institutional partnership where they've decided every major university press book that they want to buy, they only buy one. So they share it between the two of them. Two major universities have one copy of a book between them unless there is demand for more. The second is what's known as patron-driven acquisitions or demand-driven acquisitions. Some of you may have experienced this yourselves through your own institutions. Basically, you're able to use a portion of the book, go online, go through your library, read a chapter or two, and that's it. You actually have to pay for that, but it's what's called a micropayment, and only after a certain number of views and read-throughs does the library actually purchase the book. This makes good sense to a library that's trying to find more money in its budget and really only respond to what people actually want. But when the system for a long time has been set upon people purchasing large numbers of monographs to keep the system going, you can see where problems start to arise. Presses are doing everything they can to squeeze out costs without sacrificing quality, but there's only so much that can be done. 
I'd also add that quality is one of those terms that can be argued about. And what's high quality to someone might seem basic quality to another. So there's a lot that rides on this, especially because people are so invested in books as objects. Um, it's not just about the quality of the research. It's not just getting tenure. It's not just the fact that you like a book or you've always read a book. All right, so with the monograph, we talk about sacrificing costs, but how much does it cost anyway to publish a monograph? So a number of years ago, um, a study was put out that cited $20,000 as the cost of publishing a monograph. This is really based on limited partial data. This last year, Ithaca, Estenar, a research firm, um, put out a report um, based on extensive data pulled from a range of uni university presses, Chicago, Johns Hopkins, UNC, Baylor, Texas A&M, and many others, large and small, to pull this data. And what they found is maybe shocking, but it's certainly in line with my own experiences at University of California Press. How much does it cost? On average, a monograph at a larger university press costs $50,000. So for comparison's sake, the median yearly income last year was $55,000. It's a lot of money. Uh, I was kind of hoping for an audible gasp from the audience, but well, I'll just pretend that you, uh, you're all in shock right now. This is really expensive. So let me talk a little bit about what the costs are. Um, I could talk about this for hours because it's my job, uh, but I won't bore you. But I think it is helpful to get a sense of what goes into a book. You tend to think of copy editing, maybe a nice cover design. But you also have to remember there's actually a very large staff at every university press, large and small, whose job it is to create these books. And in order for them to get paid and to have their benefits met out, they need to sell the books in a certain proportion because maybe 10 to 15% of many university presses' budgets come from subsidy. The rest often has to come from their sales. So my department, acquisitions, the editors who work with authors to develop and acquire and create content, marketing, design, sales, production, accounting, administration, all the people that you don't think about when you pick up a, the physical copy of the book, all these people are there both to make the book itself come out and also to keep the wheels on, uh, maybe that's not a great metaphor, uh, all the people that is required to make sure that a press can continue to keep running. That adds up to a lot of money, and when you spread it out over a lot of books, it ends up being a lot. Now, not every book is 50,000. This is an average. Many books can be as low as 15 to 20,000. Some books can go upwards of 80 to 90,000. It depends on other things like direct spend, how much you put extra into overhead, um, for example, for really complicated books, or if there are certain marketing needs. Um, so it can vary. It's not that it's always $50,000, but that is an average, and that's a really striking number because it really hits home for me anyway how much it costs for us to keep this system going. So if we're going to keep it going, we have to find a way either to totally reconceptualize what we're doing and therefore change the amount of money it's going to cost, or we have to find ways to get that revenue. So that's where open access comes in. That's the monograph problem in my estimation. So about a year and a half ago, we launched an open access program within the press. Now this is not a separate program such as you couldn't get into UC Press, you went into UC Press Open. This is a distribution model. We start with a book, we wanna publish it, and then the author can decide if they wanna go into the open access module. So this is the book page for Lori's book. So as with every other book we publish, Lori has a page on our own website, she has a page on Amazon, she has a page on Barnes & Noble. A print book is made available for everything in our open access model. The difference is that in addition to buying a print book, anyone, anywhere in the world with an internet connection can read it digitally. Now what do I mean by digitally? Well, there's a couple ways. One, you can read it online. This is the least satisfying and the thing people often get most frustrated about when they think of digital. They think of something splashed up on a website in HTML, hard to read, sometimes green font against a black background, not very easily legible. What you'll see is a two-page layout, much like you would see in iBook or on your iPad. You can click on one side and it flips the page over. There are live hyperlinks, so you can actually, it is possible to add such things as video, uh, audio, and uh, links to other sites directly. Uh, you can also have color images, obviously. 
Um, you can do a lot more complex images that you couldn't necessarily do in a print book because you can't get the kind of the gradations correct without going really expensive, which is cost prohibitive in many monographs. This just isn't coming up, but this is not actually the most interesting part of what I wanted to show you. So while it is possible to read it online, the other thing that you can really get in any format are you can download it. That means EPUB, PDF, or Mobi. So a PDF, I don't just mean a PDF of the written manuscript. I mean a PDF of the printed book. So when you go into JSTOR, what you're seeing is a print PDF. It looks exactly like a printed book. That's what you're downloading to your computer or to any reader. Same thing with EPUB. EPUB is not universal, but it can translate into most different reading devices. So you can read it on your iPad, you can read it on your Kindle, you can read it on your Nook if anybody still has those. So again, I just want to emphasize this. So it's not so much, again, about having a print book or an electronic book. The whole point of this model is that people want both and need both for different reasons. The print book is available for purchase for people who want that. It's also available, as we all know, for the very fact that tenure committees are incredibly conservative, and as are promotion committees, as are many of the people in the academy themselves who want to buy books. So having this available is really important, not just for the quality of the scholarship and the way that it gets out, but the institutional incentives and imperatives for scholars working today. That said, in addition to the print PD, or excuse me, in addition to the print book for purchase, there are these digital versions that can be downloaded for free by anyone anywhere in the world. Lori's book didn't come out that long ago, but it's already had almost 500 people download the book. And interestingly enough, I won't, I obviously can't tell her sales, but they've been actually really quite high, much higher than we would see with a normal monograph of this type. So in some ways, putting it in this model actually promotes the book and gets it out, not just to a wider audience of people who couldn't do it before, but maybe in some cases, people who probably could have gotten it before, but might not have seen it or thought about it. Okay, so I've already gone over this a little bit. Why? Well, we want to continue making publishing decisions based on the merit of the work, not the size of the audience. Well, it's rare for me to turn down a book simply because its audience is quote unquote too small. We're dealing with monographs after all. The audience is almost always small. But there are always things that factor in, and I can't, for example, do, say, four or five books on Southeast Asia in a year simply because of the finances involved, even if I thought all of those books were excellent. So there are choices that have to be made. This allows us to expand that simply because we're able to um, bring in projects that can help fund themselves. The other part about OA, which I neglected to mention earlier, which I should have, is, of course, the fact that it's free to the reader, but it's not free to anyone, for everyone. The money has to come from somewhere. And I'll go over in a minute about where we get the money for these and what that looks like. Um, again, offering greater choice to our authors. There are a lot of people who believe very firmly in digital communication and very firmly in open access. I'm actually personally one of them. Um, other people aren't as passionate about it or are not really that concerned at all. Mostly they're just happy to see that their book is out in print and that people who, the, the community of scholars that most need to read it can get it through their libraries. We want to offer digital multimedia capabilities and flexibility while maintaining a print option, as I've said. I haven't really gone over some of the, um, the digital possibilities that are here, but you can start to imagine it when you think about the possibility of adding in-text uh, videos images, maps, and so forth. And then again, just one more time, wanting to ensure that this important scholarly work reaches its widest possible audience. Free makes for a much larger audience. It just does. People are happy to look at something for free and then make a decision about whether they want to go forward with reading it, or as opposed to having to spend that money to decide later on, or even just the time it takes to ask your librarian to order the book for you. The opportunity costs are just too much, and frankly, a lot of people put the book down. In fact, there was a really interest, recent, interesting recent study that showed when scholars were offered a choice on a screen, would you like your library to order this book? They didn't. And when the screen came up and said, your, the library is ordering this book, they actually purchased, or they actually then checked it out. So when offered the choice to say, do you actually want us to go through this one little step in order to bring this book out? People opted not to because it was just too much time. So I just bring that out as a, just an indicator of how much mental energy goes into thinking about looking at a book even in the first place. And free really removes a lot of that barrier, a lot of those barriers in my experience. Okay, so let's go over the money just really quickly because I know this is not the most interesting part to people. So the baseline title publication cost to put a project into ROA 
is $15,000. You'll notice this is very different from the $50,000 I said before. That's because this $15,000 doesn't cover all of the costs. It covers the essential costs that we need in order to make this project work. Half of those are supposed to come from an author. And when I say they come from an author, I don't mean they come from the author. I mean they come from the author's institution. They come through the author working to get grants from outside granting agencies, many of which are available right now, especially since there's so much energy behind OA. And then also through schools beyond your department. There's a library subsidy, there's a library consortium, people like Universities of California, but also University of Texas, Worthmore, Tufts. These libraries are giving us a yearly subvention to help offset the costs associated with this, even though they can still uh, get them for free through um, through the through the program. UC Press subsidy. We take money from our other um, more uh, lucrative lines to go back and sub help subsidize these books. And then revenue from print sales. As I said, everything's available POD. The prices are low. They're in paperback, and all sales then go back into a pot. Which then all the sales then go back into a pot, which is used to. Sub <coughs> Excuse me. Is then used to cement the books in the first place. All right, and then I'm just quickly going to say this is the library membership. Basically, each of the library gives a thousand dollars, and then over the course of the year, two thousand of those dollars go to each book, and then the leftover goes into what we call an author waiver fund. Now, obviously, not everyone's going to be at Cornell or an institution that really goes in strong support of of open access, or it may be that you're at a smaller school that just doesn't have the certain kinds of funding even though they really want to see you do this. And there are a lot of competition for grants, and so of course it may not be possible in every instance. So when authors committed, we have an author waiver fund to help cover those costs, especially when they're not able to get the full title publication fee. So that's the really basic model there for how that's supposed to work financially. Before we did all this, we did a faculty survey, and these were their three top concerns. And this is really backed up by a lot of research from other, uh, from other groups over a long period of time. And I think this may hopefully um, prevent some questions from you, but I hope at the end, too, that people will ask specific questions, or if you want to come up to me afterwards and talk about this, I'm more than happy to try and explain or think through some of uh, what's going on here. So the first question is, who's going to pay? As I've just said, it comes from a number of sources. You know, I think, I think books have always cost a lot of money, and most academics have been shielded from seeing that aspect of the business, and a business it is. And money makes a lot of academics uncomfortable. Uh, it feels wrong, it feels, uh, as several people put it to me, too neoliberal, whatever that means. It makes people feel uncomfortable at the very least. But the money's always being, someone is always paying for these books. None of them have ever really come back from their own. Even back in the day when we had high library purchases, it was still the major libraries subsidizing the work of tenured faculty. I think that rather, you know, however we want to see this as a crisis or a challenge or whatever kind of rhetoric we want to use, I think we, we should be saying is that it's a shared responsibility. These are things that we all benefit from and that we all think are important as part of the mission that we all ascribe to in the university system. So it's best shared among us in different ways that we can. The second question is, what does OA mean for my rights as an author? This is a little bit more complicated because it depends on what kind of license you want to choose. Sebastian alluded earlier to Creative Commons licenses, and there are a variety of those from the most strict, which is basically like a book publication, to those that allow reuse without any kind of, um, any kind of restrictions on copyright or licensing. But that question often gets merged in an author's mind with, does that mean anyone can show my work as their own? No, <laughs> that's not the case. Um, anyone can do whatever they want. I mean, I could say that I wrote Roger Bagnell's last book, but nobody's going to believe me. I could put it online. There's nothing that's going to stop me from doing that. There's nothing in uh, open access publishing that can stop you from doing that either. But there are, again, there's, it's still yours. You always retain that right as an author. What you allow people to do are to use it in different ways. So, for example, with some of the less restrictive licenses, you allow them to translate it without having to pay a fee to the originating press. That is huge, especially for companies, say, or small publishers in Africa or parts of Asia. 
or their community. They have a scholarly community. They need to, they really want to see this book in their language, but they just simply can't afford as part of their business model to pay royalties to the originating press. Under this model, they don't have to. Again, this allows for much wider dissemination, not just for people looking at it for free, but for the work to make its way out into the world. And again, this is a much more complicated conversation and one that could be given a panel all on its own. But suffice to say, your work is always protected as your work. The question then becomes, how can people use it to further their own work? And then I think, although this came third, this often comes first in when I answer questions. And isn't this vanity publishing? Well, I think there's a couple questions in that. The first one is about quality. And I haven't said anything about this, but I want to seriously foreground it now. When I say we publish something in this model, it doesn't mean you have the money, you get paid. One of the main currencies in the academy is prestige. And, acad and university presses, for university presses, that's vital and important. You can't exist without it, whatever press you're at. All books that we publish, whether they go the traditional route or through open access model, are vetted by me as the editor who decides what to publish, by peer review, who say that this is not only worthy scholarship, but is done to the standards that the press has committed to, through our faculty editorial committee, which reviews all manuscripts and reviews the peer reviews to make sure that they were correctly done and adjudicated any issues where there might be disagreements between us, the authors, or the readers. Every single book seems to, it re receives the exact same level of care, not only through peer review, but through copy editing, through marketing and design, and distribution. The only difference is you got a cheaper book, and by cheaper I mean free. The second part of vanity publishing again goes back to the money thing. And again, I understand money making people uncomfortable, the fact that they got a subsidy of $3,000 or whatever from their home department and then use that to go towards the book can make some people feel like maybe their book wasn't accepted on their own, like it was accepted for money. And again, I don't know what to say to that except people have always had to get subventions and these books have always needed to have money from somewhere. You know, I, again, I understand the, that feeling of discomfort, but the money's always been there. So you can either acknowledge that this is part of the game um, or part of what's required, let's say, to actually make this kind of scholarship uh, continue. Um, and help figure out a way to participate in that, or you can let us do it. I'm perfectly fine to do that. Many books will continue to remain in the traditional mode. Um, we don't know whether or not Luminos, this program, will continue, and um, I think it has great legs, and so far the response has been enthusiastic and in some ways overwhelming, and we've gone quite a bit farther than we have. But nobody thought we might, but nobody has a sense for the future, and things could change drastically, and. Um, the setup of the academy could change as well, and we might have to shift ground. But with all that said, I again think that partnership and communication and community is the only way forward, and publishers, publishing units, uh, research units, small schools, large schools, libraries, we're at the risk of just throwing out a couple cliches and feel-goodisms. We're kind of all in this together, and we need to find ways to work together to make this happen. And some of that means coming up with resources. Some of that means finding new ways to collaborate and partner. Some of that means trying new systems like this that seem to address some of the underlying issues, whether they're successful or they morph into new projects, or we find an array of different things that work at different places. There may not be one answer for all of us, but it's clear that the only way forward is together. So just as a final quick summation, I'll just emphasize one more time that Luminos, the name of this open access program, doesn't replace our traditional monograph program. It really just extends it. It's one more choice for an author who we want to be part of the brand of California. I'll just emphasize again that this is not just about classics or some of the uh, more focused humanities fields. This is across our humanities and social sciences publishing. Even our sociology list, which is sometimes um, seen as a very lucrative one or talked about as a lucrative field, is exploring and using a lot in open access. And then finally, I just wanted to point out that in addition to Glories, we've got two, 22 titles already published, another 12 in production right now, and 45 more under advanced contract. And that we only launched this about 16 months ago. So we're really seeing an upswing here, and we'll see what happens. At any rate, if you guys have questions afterwards, I'm happy to talk about it. Or again, if you see me out in the conference, I'm happy to talk as well. Thank you very much.